and we'll sing all the verses. I will be like Jesus. Bibles and turn with me to that portion of text which we read just a few moments ago in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, and we're looking at verses 13 through 15, which give to us eight different names of God. And so for eight weeks we have been doing a study on the names of God. Fascinating to see how many different names are given to God as the Trinity given to God the Father, given to God the Son, and given to God the Holy Spirit. It's fascinating also to see the different metaphorical descriptions that are given concerning the character and the nature of God. Last week we were continuing a study in the name the Lord of Hosts, one of the three primary names given to God in the Old Testament. As you look at the compound forms, uh, it's done over 235 times that we find that name, the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies, Jehovah Sabaoth. We noticed last week that it was used when God wants to confront evil. We saw it used that way when Elijah confronted Ahab in the name of the Lord of hosts. 
It is the name by which God is known in confronting compromise. We saw Elisha using it that way as he saw the king of Judah compromising with the king of Israel, the northern tribes. That title belongs to God as the protector of his people. It belongs to God as the judge. It belongs thus to the Lord Jesus Christ, for all judgment is committed unto the Son. That is the title that God uses to describe himself in his holiness. In Isaiah chapter 6, the great throne room vision of Isaiah 6, where God is sitting upon his throne and Isaiah falls before him to worship, and he hears the angelic host crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth, God of armies, the one who rules heaven and earth by his great and mighty power. And we discovered that that is in fact quoted in John chapter 12 as referring to our Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom Isaiah saw in that great throne room vision in Isaiah chapter 6. That title belongs to Jesus as the Messianic King, one of the titles given in Isaiah chapter 9, 7, which is so beautifully sung in Handel's Messiah, for unto us a child is born. We find, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. It's amazing, the end of that text says, the zeal of Yahweh Sabaoth, Jehovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Will the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We see that title belongs to God as the author of the eternal plan, the eternal purposes, and the eternal decrees, things that in our theology are very near and dear to our hearts as we consider the sovereign God who rules all things. And we saw that in Isaiah 14 in two different verses. God swearing by his own name, the Lord of hosts, that as he has decreed, as he has purposed, as he has planned, so it will come to pass. The sovereign God. The title Lord of hosts belongs to Jesus as the Redeemer and the one who is the first and the last. We saw it's quoted that way in Isaiah chapter 44, Isaiah 47, and of course in the book of Revelation where Jesus is declared to be the Alpha and Omega and is declared to be the Redeemer. The name the Lord of hosts belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ as the Creator. God in the Old Testament declares Lord of hosts is his name who made the divided the seas, who made the sea roar and who is the maker of all things. And our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who, according to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, is the creator of all things. So that title belongs to him. We saw that in the New Testament, that exact title is only used twice. And it is used twice in the context of God warning his own people against sin. And in those two places in the New Testament, the illustration that is given of the judgment that he will send, the chastening hand of God, the illustration in both passages we saw last week is Sodom and Gomorrah. Very serious issue to fall into the hands of the living God. And so today that brings us to the names of God, part eight. In this eighth week of looking at the names of God and his titles, we move from the basic names to some of the more important compound names and some of the titles that are shared both by father and by son. People tend to get confused because they say, I thought, well, this title belonged to Jesus, and but it sounds like it's talking about the father here. These are titles that are given to both the father and the son because they are co-equal, co-eternal, and are involved in every aspect of the plan of God, though in different areas of responsibility. The first name that we find given to both father and son is the name King. In Psalm 89, 18, for the Lord, that is Jehovah, is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. If there's any question in anyone's mind about who's in charge, God wants to make sure that we understand that he is in charge. The Lord is king. 
we find the Lord is also referred to as the lawgiver. In fact, we find several different names given to God in this passage in Isaiah. Three to be exact. For the Lord is our judge, that's Jehovah is our judge. The Lord, that's Jehovah, is our lawgiver. The Lord, again the name Jehovah, is our king. He will save us. And so we could add, and the Lord is also our deliverer. He is the one who has provided for us our salvation. And that, of course, is that God who is the one who is the judge. We saw that in our Isaiah quotation. But in Psalm 50, we find, The heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Now, as we looked at the passages in John chapter 12 last week and John chapter 5, we discovered that all judgment is committed unto the Son. Which means that this is a title that is given both to the Father and to the Son, but the Father has entrusted it to the Son to do the judgment. How important that is to make sure you have a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, whether you like it or not, someday you will stand before him as your judge. And he will ask you first what you did with him. Did you trust him, that is Jesus, alone for your salvation? Or did you not? You may have walked an aisle, you may have made a profession with your lips, but did you trust him in your heart? That is the issue. It's not what kind of an external veneer did you have, not whether or not you went to church that saves you, not whether or not you dropped paper and pieces of metal into an offering plate, it's not whether or not your parents were Christians. It's not whether or not you lived next door to a Christian. The question is, did you personally trust Christ to save you from your sins? Salvation is not a matter of getting a better life. Salvation is not a matter of suddenly becoming happy. Salvation is a matter of salvation from sin. Now, folks, when Jesus saves us from our sins, that means something in terms of practicality. It doesn't mean just there's a fire escape at the end of the road, and when you get to the end of the road, you've got the fire escape so you don't go to hell. To save you from your sins means he saves you so that you no longer have to live a life of sin. If you're truly saved, Jesus changes your life by the power of the Spirit of God. If you claim to have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and there has never been any evidence of it, it has not affected the way that you live in any way you are not saved. I hate to tell you that. But our Lord Jesus Christ will take you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. Our Lord Jesus Christ will save the wickedest of sinners. But then that person with a new life inside him, with a regenerated spirit, will no longer desire the things of the world but will desire to please his Savior. Oh yes, he'll still commit sins. We all do, as long as we're in this life. But that will no longer be his lifestyle. There will be changes that take place. God will give him power to overcome the temptations that come his way. And if that's never happened to you, you need to check and see whether or not you are reprobate or whether you are in the faith whether you have genuinely trusted in Christ. Is there no desire for holy things? Is there no desire for fellowship with God's people? Is there no desire to study the word of God? 
is on a desire to spend time in prayer. Or the few prayers that you throw up toward God is, God, why haven't you done this for me? Dear friends, the man who trusts Christ will see the work of the Spirit of God in his heart, transforming him, as the scripture tells us, into the image of Christ day by day. You will stand before Jesus as the judge someday. That's the first question he'll ask you. And if you have not trusted him alone for salvation, you are guaranteed the lake of fire. Oh, make sure that you have things right with him. We find that next he is called the rock. In fact, this is one of the favorite appellations of God by those who have trusted in him. I've only given us a few examples of it, but you will find it throughout scriptures many, many times in the Psalms, but many other scriptures as well. For example, in Deuteronomy 32, 18, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten the God that formed thee. The rock is a place of stability. It doesn't shift around. It's a place of safety. It's a place high above the floods that come in around us. It's a place where there is a defense, a place of protection. And God speaks to his people Israel and he says, you have forgotten me, your rock. You have forgotten the one that formed you. David speaks of God as the rock in the book of Psalms. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. He just gave us seven different titles for God. Seven different descriptive phrases that tell us what our real God is like. And among those is the title, The Rock. The first one that he lists, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. In Psalm 18, David says, For who is God save the Lord, or who is the rock? Save our God. There was a popular actor many years ago called himself The Rock. Turned out he wasn't. Turned out he got involved in all kinds of wicked, immoral things. That's a title that belongs to God. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. In Psalm 28, a psalm of David, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent unto me, lest if thou be silent unto me, I become like them that go down into the pit. David trusted in the Lord as his rock, because he knew what happened to those who do not. They go down into the pit. Bow down thine ear to me, deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock, for an house of defense to save me. That was Psalm 31. Psalm 94, 22. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. There are dozens of more, but do you get the idea of how stable, how strong, how trustworthy, how secure is the God who is our rock? He is the rock of our salvation. He is the rock of our defense. He is the rock in whom we trust. And you heard in some of those verses his next title, which is, He is our fortress. This the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Second Samuel 22, 2. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Psalm 71, 3, Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. When I need to run away and get safe, I need a place to go. And so David says, that When I continually resort, thou hast given me commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Psalm 91, 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Your fortress Something comes to your mind when you think of fortress. Perhaps you think of medieval castles. Perhaps you think of some of the great fortresses throughout the Middle East. You think of the Herodian, for example, just south of Bethlehem, 
a huge fortress built by Herod, another one, the Masada, down near the Dead Sea. It took the Romans years to be able to conquer that as they camped around its base. The Lord is our fortress, dear people. We can run to him and be safe. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me, Psalm 144, verse 2. And in that verse we saw one of the other titles of God. He is called our tower. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. Psalm 61, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. You need a keep. You need a central tower. You need a place of refuge. When the enemy comes like a flood upon you, you can run to God. And here's one that ties together with all the studies we have done so far on God's names. Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. When you get into difficult situations, do you try to solve the problem yourself? When you get into difficult situations, is your first response vengeance on those who have given you trouble? When you get into difficult situations and when pressure is coming into your life, do you crack and buckle? When you are in those situations where suddenly you realize you are outnumbered, do you immediately try to call your friends or get somebody else behind you? Or do you first and foremost run to Christ? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. That's a magnificent promise. Our first response in every kind of difficulty, trial, test, temptation is to remember the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, if you've trusted Christ, you are righteous in him. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. <laughs> oh, what a delightful thought. How many times I've had to run into the fortress, the strong tower, and there I find safety, and there I find rest, and there I find peace for the attack and the trouble on the outside. We find he is spoken of as our deliverer. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, Second Samuel 22, 2. Psalm 18 to the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Psalm 40, 17, but I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. There is only one who can deliver you. Only one who can extract you from whatever problem you are in with finality and with strength. The Lord is my deliverer. What great promises God's word has for God's people. But if you're not one of God's people, these are not your promises. But how simple it is. To become one of God's people by trusting in Christ alone for your salvation. And of course, one of the most beautiful pictures that is given to us of who God is, is the picture of the shepherd. You all know Psalm 23, the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. What a picture that gives to us of the character, the nature of God, the patience of God with stupid sheep. That's us. The patience of God and the kindness of God as he takes care of his sheep. The love of God 
as he cares for the lambs. The Lord is my shepherd. You know the great messianic passage in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, which has been set to music again in Handel's Messiah. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. That's the picture of God as our shepherd. Oh, how we praise God for revealing his loving character. He is indeed Yahweh Savaioth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. But that Lord is, for those who've trusted in him, he is our shepherd. And he leads us gently. And he feeds us and leads us beside the still waters. He's the one who gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them in his bosom when they cannot go farther. He gently leads those that are with young. He is the one who will seek his sheep. Ezekiel 34, 12, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. It's a promise of God to national Israel to return them to their land, which he has done. To find them where they have been scattered in his chastening and bring them home. We find it a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment in Matthew 25, 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Goats have been mixed in among the sheep. We see that in churches all over our own country, and it's true around the world. But there is coming a day when the shepherd will sever out those who are goats from the sheep. Dear friend, are you one of the goats? Or do you know for sure that you are one of the sheep? The passage that most of you probably thought of where the good shepherd is spoken of is where Jesus claims that title for himself. Psalm 23 said, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. John 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In verse 14, he says it again, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. That's why he's able to separate out the sheep from the goats. He knows his sheep. Dear friend, are you one of his sheep? You see, these descriptive titles that are given to God are designed to teach us in this practical world whether or not we're related to him, what we can do because we are related to him, what we should fear if we are not related to him. Hebrews 13, 20, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That is our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the great shepherd of the sheep. God takes for himself the title of husband. Isaiah chapter 54, 5, For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts, is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Isaiah 54, 5. 
He views himself as the husband. The husband is the one who cares for the wife. The husband is the one who provides for the wife. The husband is the one who defends the wife. The husband is the one who cares about the wife. God says, for thy maker is thy husband. In the New Testament, the church is spoken of as the bride of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of as the heavenly bridegroom. He is the one who is our maker. Thy maker is thine husband. And then he's called the Lord of hosts is his name. We saw that title applies to Jesus in the last two weeks of these messages. And thy redeemer, we saw that title applies to Jesus. The Holy One of Israel, we saw that title applies to Jesus. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. That title applies to Jesus. And he, as God, calls himself our husband, our heavenly bridegroom. Dear people, there is no earthly relationship closer than the relationship of a husband and a wife. God is trying to explain to us how much he loves us, how close we are to his heart, how intimate is our fellowship with him. Thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. That is so beautiful, dear people. If you understand what the relationship of husband and wife is supposed to be like, Ephesians 5 explains that the husband represents the Lord Jesus Christ in the marriage relationship. That the bride resents, represents the church. And as the husband and wife come together and are one, so have we been joined together with Christ by faith. God gives us this picture and he gives us the human expression of it so that we will understand better what our God is like. What love, what joy, what comfort, what peace God designed for the marriage relationship. And we let the wickedness of sin come in and break that beautiful picture. And divorce comes in and breaks the picture of the eternal security that the believer has in Christ. He will never put us away. Oh, friends. The scriptures are given to us so that we might know God and his character and so that we might reflect it. Thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. He's called the husbandman. John 15, 1, I am the vine, Jesus speaking, and my father is the husbandman. Of course, he's called the name Father. That's what we call him in prayer. We're told to pray to the Father. We don't pray to the Son. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. We address the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. But he is called Father. Jesus says, for example, in Matthew 5:48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Matthew 6.6, 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6.9, you're all familiar with it. It's where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He didn't say, Therefore, after this manner, pray ye, dear Lord Jesus. After this manner, pray, Holy Spirit. He said, after this manner, pray, Father. We address our prayers to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ, that is, in his authority, asking for things which he would approve of, and in the power of the Spirit, not in the power of the flesh. Well, I see our time is coming to an end. I have just gotten to part, through part one. Part two 
gives the nine descriptive titles given to the Father that are distinct from the names and the titles which he shares with his Son. The ones that we've just looked at are various titles that we find, many of them, used of both Father and Son. They all describe for us what our God is like, so that we might know how to properly be related to him, how to respond to him, how to express ourselves to him, how to thank him, and how with joy to rejoice that he is our God. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for the privilege of being in your presence today. O oh, Father, you are our God. You are glorious, you are majestic. You are the one to whom we come in humility, thanking you for your great provision of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are a sinful people. Without your grace, we are lost and undone. Without your irresistible drawing and wooing us to Christ, we have no hope. And yet how we thank you for the precious promises of your word that if anyone will trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, you give them at that very moment eternal life, life that never ceases. And you have proved it because Christ loved us so much he died for our sins. You proved it because after three days you raised him in glory from the dead, guaranteeing that your promises are true. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here today, young or old, people who have heard the word of God over and over, or people who have never heard before, that today that man, woman, boy, or girl might trust in Christ alone to save them from their sins and to give them eternal life. And so, Father, we commit this moment to you Thou, O God, who searchest the hearts, search our hearts and see if there be any wicked way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.